Here we go, another episode of Ask the Lawyer. Today we're going to ask about what you can do if you know that somebody is trying to defraud the government. Here to answer our questions is attorney Jason T. Brown of Brown LLC based in New Jersey. Jason, thank you for taking some time to answer our questions today. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Let's talk about the False Claims Act. Tell us what the False Claims Act is and how that applies to whistleblowing. Sure. The False Claims Act, and when people refer to it, it's a federal act generally, and it incentivizes whistleblowers to come forth with information about entities that are systemically defrauding the federal government out of money. Uh, typically, this happens with Medicare fraud, Medicaid fraud, defense contractor fraud. And when I talk about systemic, I mean that it doesn't necessarily have to be ongoing. It could be a one-time fraud that's a large amount, but I'm trying to differentiate. It doesn't cover if a neighbor is defrauding Social Security or uh, defrauding workers' comp. But there's other ways to deal with that that don't really incentivize the individuals to come forward through this statute. The purpose behind the statute is to get whistleblowers who are well-placed to provide information to the government secretively that can end and cut down fraud against the government. So you're saying if I'm a whistleblower and, and I'm successful, I'm entitled to compensation? Well, you're entitled to it if the government's actually able to recover money. And there's a couple different tracks of recovery for successful whistleblowers. And uh, under the False Claims Act, at least the federal portion, and there's also state uh, False Claims Act, which mm -hmm. I can get into in a second. But when you blow the whistle under the False Claims Act, the government gets to look at the case first. And if the government intervenes, generally you can get from 15 to 25 percent of what the government recovers through that litigation. If the government doesn't intervene, you can get up to 30 percent. But it's a little bit of a trade-off because if the government intervenes, the average value over the years for these cases is roughly $13 million. Uh, if it doesn't intervene, it's somewhere between two and three million. Okay. And those are, those are just averages. So you may get a bigger percentage, but lower pool of money. Explain to me what you mean by if the government intervenes. What, what does that mean? Sure. These cases are filed under seal, so you present them to the government first to decide whether or not they want to handle the litigation okay. directly. If the government intervenes, they're really controlling the shots at the beginning, middle, and end. Uh, if the government intervenes, they file a formal intervention notice indicating they will be handling the case. If the government doesn't intervene, it could take several tracks. It could not intervene and give the green light to us as private counsel to handle the case. Mm -hmm. Or it could say we're not intervening and try to shut down the litigation. And uh, under certain memos, something called the brand memo that's been lately released, there's been some uh, play back and forth whether or not the government can shut down a case when it's actually been defrauded. Uh, the government may want to do so for several reasons. But it's highly complicated type of creature, and you attack it on a case-by-case -case basis. So without getting too deep into the weeds, is there a general situation in which the government would or would not intervene? Is it based solely on the, um, the size of the case you're talking about? Well, that certainly is a factor. I and mean, the government has limited resources. And the more at stake, the more inclined they are to try to intervene and assist. The, the less in controversy, if it's less than a half million dollars, almost certainly they're not going to get involved. Uh, but never say never, because if you have a very easily provable violation that they're interested in tackling, like an opioid type of case, which is prioritized for this administration, well, maybe they get involved for other reasons. Now, what happens if uh, I go through with the whistleblowing and uh, I suffer some retaliation because of the whistleblowing, Jason? What, what happens then? Sure. Uh, our firm certainly protects whistleblowers, and the statute protects whistleblowers as well. There's some strident protective mechanisms in the False Claims Act statute itself and other whistleblower statutes that you may potentially invoke. Uh, one has to remember, when you file a case under the False Claims Act, if your attorney files it properly, it's under seal, meaning the defendant slash employer may not know about it for years. So even though you may think the employer knows, the employer generally does not know. Okay. Uh, as the case progresses, certain things happen. The company may be hit with certain subpoenas, or it may have to attend a deposition, and they may start to suspect somebody has blown the whistle, but they don't know for certain until it becomes unsealed. So you have time to plan, and one of the things we do as a firm is discuss what is your parachute? What are your options? If the company has a lot of integrity at the end of the day, well, they're going to do what's right when confronted with the wrongdoing. They'll mop it up, clean it up, 
pay the fine that they should rightfully pay. And in all likelihood, you still probably can work uh, at that location. If they're unscrupulous uh, to the core, you might want to think about getting out of there anyway. Uh, but towards the end, when you become revealed, even though they shouldn't retaliate against mm -hmm. you, they probably will. So you, you mentioned the word planning. Uh, what part of this planning do I get uh, someone like yourself involved? Do I, do I contact an attorney before I ever blow the whistle? Is there a time when it's too late to get an attorney involved? What's your, what's well, your advice? You always better get a competent attorney involved early and often <laughs> into cases along these lines. Yes, there are times when it's too late. We have people coming to us when they've blown the whistle years ago mm -hmm. and the government handled it criminally and the government may recover tens or hundreds of millions of dollars and they want their piece of that pie for doing the right thing and they just can't get it. Or they go to the wrong individual and they file something in the wrong manner and it's not under seal. And you don't blow the whistle the right way and before you're out of the gate, your case is done. So you should, this is a highly nuanced type of law. You should hire a firm uh, that's involved in this type of law that dedicates a portion of its practice and expertise to handling key tam or whistleblower type of litigation. Uh, my background as a former FBI special agent and legal advisor, it helps us interface with the federal government because I've been on their side of it as right. well as the private side of it. And uh, you mentioned a little while ago that most of your uh, advice so far has been as it applies to the federal cases. Uh, I assume there's some difference with, on the state level. Uh, can you give us some of those? Sure. Uh, certain states have statutes that go beyond the federal statute. So a lot of times we get calls that there's insurance fraud being committed and massive insurance fraud. And as counterintuitive as it may be, most states do not have a mechanism to allow a whistleblower to come forward and provide information and be incentivized to do so. Mm -hmm. However, California and Illinois are two states that do have those mechanisms. And California in particular, and actually Illinois in the statute, you could recover up to 50% of what the government recovers in those cases. Wow. So you're highly incentivized in California as a whistleblower or Illinois as a whistleblower, not just to blow the whistle on fraud against the government, but if you know of widespread insurance fraud being committed. And uh, you're based in, in New Jersey, but uh, are you able to help people anywhere in the country? We, we take cases nationwide. We're licensed in many different jurisdictions, uh, not just New Jersey. And those that we're not, we pro hoc vice or go through somebody else's license and work with them as local counsel at no additional expense to our client. Excellent. Jason, as usual, uh, just a fascinating and, and helpful information. I sure appreciate your time today. Thank you. That's going to do it for this episode of Ask the Lawyer. My guest has been attorney Jason Brown of Brown LLC based in New Jersey. If you want the best information about whistleblowing or you're ready to choose a lawyer that lawyers choose, make sure you visit askthelawyers.com. Also, please take a sec and like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking on the button below. Thanks for watching. I'm Rob Rosenthal with askthelawyers.com.